Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy, a proud member of the Sightcraft Network. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives, with lots of authenticity and a touch of humor. Here is your host, Steve Bisson. C'est toujours la bienvenue. It's always welcome. I appreciate the intro. And welcome to episode 146. This is going to be part two of uh, the interview with Catherine Branca. Catherine Branca is a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, experienced with mental health substance abuse, worked with first responders, and has been doing trainings for CIT officers since 2019. Just giving you a quick review of her bio. If you want to hear the first part of the interview, go to the episode last week. But here is the second part, and I'm sure you're excited about it. Getfree.ai. Yes, you've heard me talk about it previously in other episodes, but I'm going to talk about it again because Getfree.ai is just a great service. Imagine being able to pay attention to your clients all the time instead of writing notes and making sure that the note's going to sound good and how are you going to write that note and things like that. Getfree.ai liberates you from making sure that you're writing what the client is saying because it is keeping track of what you're saying and will create after the end of every session a progress note. But it goes above and beyond that. Not only does it create a progress note, it also gives you suggestions for goals, gives you even a mental status if you've asked questions around that, as well as being able to write a letter for your client to know what you talked about. So that's the great, great thing. It saves me time, it saves me a lot of aggravation, and it just, speeds up the progress note process so well and for $99 a month I know that that's nothing that's worth my time that's worth my money you know the best part of it too is that uh, if you want to go and put in the code Steve 50 when you get the service at the checkout code is Steve 50 you get $50 off your first month and if you get a whole year you save a whole 10% for the whole year so again Steve 50 at checkout for getfree.ai will get you $50 off for the first month and like I said get a full year get 10% off get free from writing notes get free from always scribbling while you're talking to a client and just paying attention to your client so they win out you win out everybody wins and I think that this is the greatest thing and if you're up to a point where you got to change the treatment plan well the goals are generated for you so getfree.ai code Steve 50 to say $50 on your first month. And I, you know, I just said, I'm going to hurt my finger. So therefore you probably should section me, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Get your ass out of here. Or 1030 yep. or whatever it's called in different States. I know this is just not a Massachusetts thing, but no, you're right. And I think that the other part too, about being culturally competent is that if they, if someone had a completed suicide the week before, they might go on a call where someone says they're suicidal and that police officer, that crisis condition, whatever the case may be, might want, might be trigger happy, so to speak, and put them in the hospital as quickly as they possibly can because of their past. Mm -hmm. So the other cultural competency is to know where a person's at, uh, not only the client that you're facing or the, per, you know, the person in the community, but also where the person's at, because I've, I've had that experience, too, in my, my, my work, so. Oh, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense, too, right? Like, we as clinicians are trained in things. Not all of us have training in suicide prevention specifically, but we have a lot of mental health, you know, background and training, obviously. So that's not what police officers and firefighters and EMS, you know, have training in. So, like, of course it makes sense where they may be a little bit more quick to section somebody or to, you know, commit somebody against their will to go into treatment, like, because that's, that is their only tool. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And also kind of part of the whole, like mental health professional can play a role in advocating for better, like treatment and services. Like we can play a role in advocating for better training and support around this kind of stuff too, for people who are dealing with, suicide and all kinds of other mental health issues. 
So wait, you're telling me that it's not just about trauma. Yep. I know. Spoiler alert, right? Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think that we also bonded really well on is that, is that, you know, like, I, and I'm not saying there's no trauma. We're, we're, we're not, we're not denying that, but there's been a ton of research done on that. But where, what about, you know, getting home, getting off work, so to speak, being a family member, being an equal partner to your partner when you were a person of authority, when you were in the, like working as a police officer or a firefighter or EMT or paramedic, because you're an authority in some ways when you're there. I think that there's yeah. a lot of that stuff that we, you know, we kind of discovered through our research. Yeah. And we have talked offline about this, but a lot of people don't come into therapy because of quote unquote trauma. They right. come into therapy because as the first responder, because their relationship is going to shit or they're drinking too much or they are gambling too much or they can't pay their bills or they're getting divorced. Like, and then maybe once you address those kind of initial reasons for coming in, we get deeper into things and their experiences on the job. But like a lot of the times it's not necessarily the job related things that are going on that are bringing somebody into treatment as a first responder. Well, let's talk a little bit about the research then since you're bringing that up. Sometimes it is about work because administration mm -hmm. of betrayal and colleague conflict comes up often. And that's not trauma. That's just interpersonal relationships. Yep. <laughs> and I think that that's where we, when we talk about cultural competency, you know, like if you're angry at your chief for XYZ reason or your lieutenant or what have you, it doesn't really matter. But to me, it's some of the stuff that I talk about more often than not in my therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about the research that we, the study that we did or? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, we can go wherever you want. You're the <laughs> guest essentially, but okay. uh, I think that would be a good place to go right now, but it's up to okay. you. Yeah, no, I mean, your podcast, so I respect your authority. No, no one um, wants to hear me anymore. They've heard me for yeah. like almost three years now. They want to hear other people. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, they're stuck with me, so um, they want to at, hear least you. To, at least today. So yeah, I think me and you also connected over the fact that like we enjoy doing research and um, right. we have this whole like working with first responders as part of our um, current work. So we wanted to do a study around understanding what first responders are going through both on the job, but then also fact, also other things that are kind of going on in their life that's impacting their ability to do their job. So all of that with the intention of tailoring resources to be better suited to them, reducing stigma, and then also just creating awareness of like the need for this stuff, like we talked about before. Um, yeah, so we did a survey, sent it out, uh, 61 people, 61 first responders responded to the survey. I think the biggest thing that we saw was, I mean, 70% indicated they are feeling burnt out. Almost half of them had been working in the field for more than 20 years, which was super interesting. And then when you talked about the administrative betrayal piece, when we were talking about what's the toughest part of being a first responder, dealing with administration was um, the highest ranked answer. So, yeah, I think that interpersonal piece within the job is really impactful. And administrative betrayal and dealing with administration can have all kinds of different issues within it, right? So we're talking about like losing faith that they can count on their leadership for support, um, leadership being unapproachable. If they're, say they're home after getting hurt on the job and they don't hear from anybody for three weeks, like feeling isolated, um, all kinds of other things. So yeah, just as kind of an introduction to the survey we've been referencing a couple of times. Yeah, and I, I, you know, and if anyone's interested in doing the follow-up survey as well as seeing the research, more than happy to offer that. And uh, I'll leave my... Uh... Catherine in my email in the show notes, but I think it was important for me to bring up the administration uh, betrayal because to me, it was fascinating that even in the comments that came up more often than not. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we, what, what me and Catherine also realized is that there needed to be a more in-depth survey in regards to specific questions. 
and that was one of them. And, um, you know, I, as we collect our responses, it, it's been interesting from my perspective that it's a lot of what, what's funny about the responses is that it's not like a general administration betrayal, but it's also kind of like being told one thing and then speaking on the other half because of finances and all that, and then not following up on it. That's been the mostly what's been reported. And I think that that's hard for us as therapists to say, well, go talk to your boss. Uh, Cause it's not, we're, we're, this is not corporate. This is uh, w- what do we call it? Paramilitary bullshit. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, systems. <laughs> and um, I think that plays a huge factor too. And it's a paramilitary kind of like hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And you, brought up the story about the chief who like was checking on their person who was in therapy with you like imagine if they had just been checking to see how they were doing like instead of it being a negative thing right like or even if they were just checking in with the person who was in therapy like how's it going how are you doing right like that's such a different thing than like what's up with this person like you know what the hell is wrong with them (laughs) it's like a completely different conversation right and it goes back to even being trauma informed. I'm I'm sick and tired. I've think I've, people, my audience might be sick and tired of hearing me talk about this, but trauma informed is not knowing about trauma. Trauma informed is a little more complex than that. And, you know, part of not only do we do surveys, uh, you know, maybe you can speak a little more, but you also do trainings on that for CIT models or. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think about being trauma informed, I consider it a universal precaution, like putting on PPE or putting on gloves when you're like going to a medical call. It's just something that you do to prepare to interact with somebody who is in crisis or who is going through something. And this isn't like, this applies in all kinds of situations, right? Not necessarily just like working with the public if you're a first responder, but it also is in looking out for the your fellow first responder too. It's basically changing your mindset instead of asking somebody what's wrong with you, it's what's happened to you, right? We're not looking at somebody as having a deficit in their skill, like, I'm sorry, in their will. We're not saying like, what's wrong with you that you can't handle your life? Like, we're saying, wow, something really must have happened where you just don't have the skills to cope with it. And like, what can I do to help you? It's just having a completely different shift around that. But yeah, so as far as the trainings, so when I was working as a co-response clinician, but then also the suicide prevention program that I ran, I did a lot of trainings for CIT, which is, I know you've talked about this on your podcast before, but it's crisis intervention teams for police officers. So they have a 40 hour week long training where they go and get all kinds of information about mental health and substance use. And it's becoming a CIT officer would be a way to better serve the public because a lot of the time, the police, fire, EMS, they're dealing with mental health calls all the time. So if you have a CIT officer going to a mental health call, they may be more prepared than somebody who hasn't been through this 40-hour training. So um, different topics within that CIT 40 hour week long training include trauma. I do trainings on trauma informed policing, um, stress, resiliency, and suicide prevention. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I've, you know, I've done some CIT trainings on mental health, psychotropic medication, as well as substance use. But I think that, you know, one of the things is that where, and I don't know where you stand, but I'm going to tell you my point of view. I'm not opposed to the co-response model. In fact, I love the co-response model, except the co-response model doesn't get the finances. So you can't have a clinician there 24 seven and telling someone who's having a mental health crisis at two o'clock in the morning, can you wait till 8 a.m. when our crisis (laughs) clinician shows up and then have that crisis? It's just not possible. So having a model that has both, uh, and I can't pronounce THs really well, so now you can tell, I think that it's so important to be able to notice that and be able to have both of those services. And that's why I'm a big fan of the co-response model as much as the CIT. I used to be a person that says you guys sit on one side or the other. Um, I don't believe that anymore. I believe that both have value. Um, And I don't know what your thoughts are, but. 
Oh yeah, I completely agree. I they definitely both have value. I think being a co-response clinician, of course, you know, if some I personally have 10 years of experience, that's just going to give me more tools and skills to handle different crisis calls, especially working as a crisis clinician before, you know. So there's all kinds of things that go into my ability to handle different things when working as a co-response clinician. But like you said, I'm not going to be there at 2 a.m. when somebody wants to kill themselves. So having an officer, and this applies to all first responders, but we're just talking about CIT right now, but having an officer who is or feels more prepared to handle that may and hopefully creates a better outcome, both for the public, but then also like when we talk about burning out, feeling burnt out and like compassion fatigue and all kinds of things that first responders are struggling with that we saw in our survey, maybe giving them these tools will help, I don't know, just a thought to like avoid that burnout and compassion fatigue and other things a little bit more just because I think about it as like a toolbox, like right. how many things do they have at their disposal to handle different calls in different situations? Um, I think the better. So, And I think it's also fascinating thinking about our research and talking about the call response CIT model stuff. Um, having first responders tell me that they want to learn how to do yoga or they already do yoga. I think when I started doing this stuff in 2006, if you told me that that would be the response in 2024, I said, you're full of shit. Uh, yep. But, you know, we have seen a shift in the culture, I think, in the time that we've been around. I don't know what your thoughts are, but I definitely see yeah. a shift in the culture. And the survey really proves that, too. Absolutely. I think, too, we talked, going back to kind of reducing stigma, a big part of that was making resources available for things like yoga and meditation. And like you said, like, it's almost a little mind blowing, because it's just not something that you would ever expect. But it's like, a big part of what people say that they want. And I, the least, I, I think the least we can do as professionals in this space is create those resources for them. And I think that that's one of our biggest concerns. I think we were talking off air about this, but you know, starting in April of 2024, I'm going to restart my uh, group for first responders. And for those who don't know what I consider first responders, police, EMS, paramedics, fire, ER people. And let's not forget our correctional staff who get to see first responders stuff firsthand in a community that's very gated, but nonetheless, first responder stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, and dispatch, too. I forgot dispatch every time in my it's okay. It's not okay because Lisa, who's gonna run the group with me, is a dispatcher. You Lisa, were getting there. I saw you going there. I just Lisa, helped you get there. Don't worry, Lisa's gonna kick my ass anyway, so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh love you, Lisa. Um, but I, I, I think that that's the stuff that we need to work on getting those resources in the hands of first responders. I mean, it, this might be you know, we didn't really rehearse any questions here. But what what can we do to get those resources more in the hands of first responders? Because that's the hardest part, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I think it starts with buy-in. And I think that's why what I always strive for is to have those voices guide the work that we're doing and first responders being part of this research and like us using this research to create those resources. Like we're not just talking out of our ass right like we actually have this information speak for yourself well yeah maybe you steve but <laughs> no. um like we actually have this coming directly from first responders doing the work every day saying nope we want this like please you know this is something that we're interested in so yeah but then also i think like you said having somebody who is a dispatcher or having somebody within the group that is a peer that actually understands the day-to-day -day work like we've talked about a few times like we're not first responders so we we don't know we have experience that is close to it but we don't know so having those peers not only part of things like groups and other things but like almost vouching for it <laughs> and saying look like i know it's hard to show up to a group and talk about the shit you're going through but i'm gonna do it i think it'd be cool if you did it or whatever you know i think having that like voice within a department goes really, really far. You, you know, and there's a couple of things I want to say to that. The, the follow-up research, interestingly enough, 
is mixed as to having a first responder or not running the group with a clinician. It's actually fascinating to me that I'm like, no, I'd rather have just a clinician, which is, again, counterintuitive in many, mm. many ways, number one. But I also think that, you know, in number two, which is also very important, is that when I said to, I, this is a guy that, again, I'm sorry for stereotypes, but fuck, I live in a world where, the, you know, stereotypes exist for a reason. Burly guy that I see for treatment uh, who happens to be a first responder, I'm not going to tell you what branch. He's like, are you going to be able to do some yoga here? I'm like, are you interested? Well, it'd be nice if we can just have like a yoga. I'm like, I'm going to do research to find a yoga place for you guys so that one day when we're running the group, we're going to go to that studio and we're going to do yoga. It it was just, again, counterintuitive and call me stereotypical. I'll live with myself. But I was like, man, what have we done to this system and how can we keep this momentum going? Yeah. And I think... I'm glad that you brought up the piece about like maybe it's better to have a group run with just a clinician versus a peer. But I think what I've heard in the past is first responders being afraid to take advantage of peer support because they're afraid that what they say is going to be shared with other people. And even as just a regular old civilian, like I don't want my shit out there. So I totally get it. Right. Like that's why you're on a podcast. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I had to go there. Sorry. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> I can handle it. Um, but yeah, seriously, like it's so true. I mean, I get it. So like, it's uh, back to that, like, it's a fine line. It's a dance. Like it's all about, you need to have all of these things available so that somebody who doesn't want to go to a peer group can just have a clinician group. Somebody who does want a peer can have access to a peer. Right. And, you mm-hmm. know, I, I think that that's one of my rules too. When I talk to the first response, excuse me, my, not only for my group, but even individually, I see, I tell them that if you see someone who happens to be a police officer that, you know, from a different uh, department or whatever, I would say, if you talk about it outside the, when you open that door and you talk to someone, you'll never be allowed in this office again. My line, and 100%. And my line is very clear on that. And it's never going to change because it's, it's hard to expose yourself emotionally it's harder to do it in a mental health realm so if you go hey i saw you at steve's office that's like the biggest exposure like no one else might know who what steve does i can be a fucking yodeler for all they care (laughs) but nonetheless the other one feels exposed and i can't have that and you know it's surprising how much the guys really responded to that too and gals too i have some women in this group too in the past um but i think that it's peers you feel like they bring be like again What's what's my firefighter once said I, it, on my podcast? It was who was his name? Eric, uh, who said, you know, if you want gossip to be told, you you know, you go you go talk to someone, you tell a firefighter, and yes, it's a stereotype, and I'll live with myself. Thank you very much, uh, but it's the truth too because like mm-hmm. we fucking talk, and my firefighters were very happy that I said no one ever talks about like it's almost like Fight Club essentially, right? Yeah, it has to be to work. And they, the guys really respected that. And not only that, respected me for saying it out loud. And I think yeah. that that's the other part, too, that we find with the survey is that we they want that confidentiality in order to move forward. So sometimes that's why they don't want to go to groups. And that's why we need to be able to uh, vet some people, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as much as we want these resources to be super widely available and like everyone have access, it's also important as leaders of it, of the groups and other things that um, we're being very careful about the dynamics of the group. So yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, you know, part of the continuous work that we're going to do. And I'm going to not share too much, but we found some interesting resource, but you know what they they do is they vet the therapist to work with first responders and I, I think that's a fascinating process that hopefully we can continue discussing among ourselves and it, it's not easy going to a therapist and I, i've seen it too like too many guys come in and say oh yeah i went into some, this person who said they worked with first responders and they ended up wanting to just talk about you know blue babies and shit like that and that's you know that's not how i work as a therapist 
but people who say they're first responder therapists versus being a first responder therapist is two different things in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the truth of it is like those people are going to get found out real quick. So I think if you have first responders who feel comfortable coming to you and then you have somebody that they went to that they don't like, they're going to tell you. Um, so it's good. I think that's a good thing, right? Because this is not the space for like that voyeurism or like, you know, wanting that, you know, those war stories. So absolutely. I think too, the other thing I wanted to mention about like different resources, we found too that in our survey, they were hoping to have more like in-house therapy um, and almost like in a mandated way, which, you know, again, may be potentially surprising, but also like totally understandable because I think it takes away all of that stigma around going, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, it's six months checkup, like, let's go in and talk for an hour or whatever, whatever that would look like. I don't know. But I think there's different ways that we can make these things work within this field based on what we found in our survey. And I, and I really think that, uh, you know, I, I'm so proud that we met each other and we're going to work together on this because it's so easy to hear people talk about first responders. It's another thing for people to actually be competent at this shit, you know, and unfortunately, the ones that I found the most better at this is the ones who have done ride alongs or people who have worked as first responders. And unfortunately, in the therapeutic world, and no, no offense to all my therapy, therapy friends out there, I'm not trying to shit on you guys. They're few and far between that are able to get that. Well, and the thing is, like, like I said, everyone is good at different things. Like, I don't, it's not my favorite. And I, I'm not as necessarily good at, like, working with children, you know? And there's many, many therapists who really love that and do great work doing that. So, like, there's no disrespect, no hate. It's just that we all enjoy and are better at different things. I'm, I'm able to, you know, you talk about gallows humor, but like being able to also kind of like hear a story and knowing that you can safely say to a guy, wow, oh, it's really fucked up. Mm -hmm. When I say guy for the record, I also mean gals. Please understand there's no sexism in my language here. Um, and if you're offended, write me. What do I care? But I think that being able to say, wow, that's fucked up is probably more validating to a first responder world, but you got to choose the moment. And that's not something you can teach someone. It's got to be really at the right moment, the right time. And you had to be there, done that in order to understand that and make gallows humor and at the right place at the right time, making that comment right away is not necessarily healthy. And sometimes mm -hmm. it is very healthy to say it right away because that'll like lighten up the mood but you can't teach that. That's, you know, you can't, there's no class yes. for that. Right. Right. You don't learn that in like your master's degree. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with working as a first responder. One of the things that I get pissed off, uh, no matter when ha something bad happens in the first responder world, oh, well, they shouldn't know better. They chose this profession and all that. Listen, ass, do you think that the fucking classes do everything to tell you, oh, this is what you're going to do in this situation? What about your job? Is your job ever prepared you for everything you're going to fucking do? No. All right. Fuck off. Same, same thing for my job. Sorry. That's one of my biggest pet peeves, like running after first responders. Are there bad first responders out there? Yes. 5% of them are shitty. Just like 5% are shitty therapists. 5% are shitty Dunkin' Donuts workers. 5% are shitty doctors and whatever profession you want to choose. That's going to happen. It's just life. But to yeah. overgeneralize and then judge them for something that you have no fucking clue that pisses me off. And I'm not a first responder. I'm just some guy who treats them. And that pisses me off to no ends. No, I can relate. And I part of what we saw in our survey is that dealing with the public is also hard. And public perception is also hard for first responders. And there's lots of things that they wish um, people knew about what it's like to be a first responder. Uh, and so... Yeah, like I don't know how to be an accountant, so I'm not going to go do your taxes or act like I know how to do taxes. So I completely agree that it pisses me off too for people to act like experts on how to be a first responder when they're not one. So agreed. You know, and I, I think that that's why that survey was so important and the follow-up is going to be even more important. I added a question on uh, gender. Mm-hmm not what gender the person is, but how is it to integrate women in the 
first responder world, yes, there have been very com, com uh, there's been many nurses, many PAs, many doctors in the ERs. Um, there's been many female EMTs and paramedics, not necessarily at fire or police, but fire and police is fairly new to have female presence. And again, I'm getting, again, preliminary information. There's been a lot of adapt adaptation issues and not because of gallows humor. It's not what you think, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely looking forward to like, diving deeper into that for sure. I think that I've met, you know, like I, I, I joke, no joking here. It's the truth. I don't think my gallows humor is any different with Catherine. And that doesn't even affect her. It doesn't even touch her. Same thing with the guys. It's just like the, I do the same thing. But there are specific challenges that women face in this environment that is particularly interesting. And I can't wait to share those responses as we go along. But, um, you know, we've been talking for over an hour now. And uh, I might make this a two-part two episode because I could go on and on. Obviously, we're, it's clear that we get along and we have the same uh, motivations but maybe we, you can um, tell me more about the services you offer, because I think that might be important for other people to hear that. Yeah, sure. So I offer, like I mentioned before, CIT training. So uh, for people who run like CIT TTACs and um, organize different CIT trainings, I'm definitely somebody who is willing and would love to participate in CIT training. And then I also offer consultation for first responders, frontline workers to improve wellness within their workplace. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, I would love to talk to you as well. And we didn't even touch on that, but, you know, eating and nutrition. Yes. Another, and, and you know, I, I want to give credit to Catherine because she's the one who brought that up when we first did the survey. And I'm like, that's a great question. And we put that in there and lo and behold, she was absolutely right. Yeah, it's a huge passion of mine to when we talk about like what you're putting in your body as far as like health and wellness uh something that I think is really overlooked and can be like huge and make a big difference so yeah no well, and you know when you do this job I mean I was just a ride along but sometimes you know our our meal between two calls is a McDonald's bullshit or uh and that wasn't healthy but it was funny that if we had time to sit down and chat, it was so much easier to finish that shift. And even those little things during a shift makes a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was made fun of for like bringing my salad in from home and eating it. Right. So um, got to do what you got to do. Well, how people can, you know, if they do, you talked about CIT, you talked about helping first responders. And obviously, we're going to continue working on our projects together. So obviously, you're going to be some stuff there, too. How can people reach you in order to talk more about any of these things? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. So my website is just my name.com. So Catherine Branca, and it's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-B-R-A-N-C-A.com. I'm only on LinkedIn because social media is all kinds of thoughts about social media so um you can find me on linkedin and then my email address is just katherine ladc at gmail.com so and what we're going to do is we're going to put that in the show notes so people can reach out for Catherine. and um you know i'm going to have her back on because because i could do whatever i want number one but number two yeah. I, I i really I, again i said she's my friend but I, frankly i think that it's rare that we're able to talk so frankly about mental health and first responders in a way that the island of isolation that 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 it, that it creates. It's nice to have a ally, a friend, and someone that we can trust in that island. And I do appreciate you for that too. Me too. Yeah, I feel the same way. Looking forward to talking to you outside of this, but uh, looking forward to uh, having you on also again. Thank you so much, Steve. This was great. Well, that completes episode 146. Catherine Branca, we're going to keep on working together anyway. So I will say thank you, but I know we're going to work together. I hope you guys really enjoyed the interview as much as I did. But episode 147 will be a uh, one about imposter syndrome. And I don't know if uh, you guys have ever felt that, but I'm going to definitely be talking about that. It will be a solo episode for me, so I will talk to you then. 
please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States and Canada.